Hello you beautiful audience. This is Reddit Stories and today's topic is. What are you sick of being romanticized or being portrayed positively? Poverty, it's always some family that is struggling but lives in some run-down apartment that is merely small and not modern, but is heated and furnished and always has some amazing view or rooftop access that makes them feel the world is really theirs for the taking. Nope nope nope. Unheated rat infested roach motel with dangerous neighbors and a view of a fire escape. Cut electric, cut heating, dinner of saltines if anything. Poverty is absolute shit and can be a death sentence to your health and sanity. Terminal illness. It doesn't open your eyes, it doesn't give you a better outlook on life. Most of them are horrible degenerative diseases that scrape away people's lives bit by bit until they are ghosts of their former selves. Growing up in the hood. Sure, the story of triumph and making it out is great. But losing loved ones and friends throughout your childhood is a miserable and traumatizing experience. Not to mention the poverty and daily uncertainty. I grew up in a rough part of the UK. Lots of government owned low income housing. Similar to the projects in the US. You don't get time to just be a kid in those types of areas. I got the chance to move to a much much safer area of the US to raise my child. He's 13 now and still believes in Santa. Honesty I don't think he does, but he doesn't talk about it and neither do we, he's had an amazing childhood and I worked hard to make sure he never worried about the same things I did growing up. Fighting on the streets, worrying about being stabbed, being hungry and having old shitty clothes. I'm not wealthy slash rich by any means but hopefully when I take him back to where I grew up he can appreciate what my wife and I have given him. That being said, I don't look back on my childhood with regret. My parents did their best and now I'm doing my best and I'm improving my situation. Hopefully he improves his situation and can provide a better life for his kids. As an adoptee, someone discovering that they were adopted and then venturing off to find their real parents and this leads to them finding that thing that was missing from their lives. I've known that I was adopted for as long as I can remember. My real parents are the, the ones that raised me, loved me, and nurtured my thirst for knowledge. I've had some contact with my biological mother but have only some ethnic elements as points of commonality. Never had any contact with my biological father and have no pressing urge to reach out. I wouldn't refuse him. Being shamed if you happen to make money as an artist. Because you can't be a real artist if you're not suffering. I was told I shouldn't ask for money for commissions because isn't it selling out? Isn't doing the art its own reward? No Greg, drawing your OC is my job. I would be working on other things if I didn't need to be paid to live. Cancer diagnosis and its treatment. We are not all strong brave warriors and insisting we act like we are, to assuage non-cancer sufferers fear of our diagnosis, doesn't allow us to safely process the trauma we are experiencing. Please stop. Edit, thank for the awards. My sleeping tablet knocked me out and I woke up to a lot of unexpectedness. I'm in active treatment for breast cancer currently. I don't consider myself a warrior or brave. Those labels make me wretch more than the chemo. I've taken to calling myself a cancer passenger as it mostly feels like I accidentally got on the wrong bus and now I'm holding on tight to see if I can get to my desired destination via an unexpectedness detour. I am sorry for all the raw loss shared below but bloody grateful for it too. We need desperately to talk more honestly about the reality of cancer and its treatments to allow us to manage it better and give us patients more dignified ends of our choice, if slash when that time comes. Thank to you all. I also hate that people expect us to constantly break down just because they need to. My best friend kept telling me it's okay to break down and let him be my shoulder to cry on. I didn't need that and certainly didn't want to hear him crying about my diagnosis. I needed positivity and normalcy. It's literally what got me though cancer twice. I also had a boss telling co-workers he didn't believe my diagnosis and that he thought I was losing weight from drug abuse. I was floored. My bills didn't stop just because I was sick. 
I still worked and only took off a couple of days after each chemo treatment for as long as possible. People have no idea how different each form of cancer and its treatments can be. Some put you immediately down, some don't. You don't always lose your hair. It doesn't make any of it less stressful. You have to deal with it the way you feel most comfortable. I may not have any of the same side effects or treatments as someone else. My second time was nothing like my first. I just needed love and support. And as far as the you're so brave comments, like no I literally have two choices. Do the treatments or don't. Anyone who doesn't accept the other has no choice but to do the treatments. It's not because I'm so brave. I just am not ready to go. Chasing a girl slash boy who doesn't want to be chased. And then making them feel bad, for not wanting to be with you. If someone isn't interested, then it's okay. It's not the end of the world. Don't harass them. It's not a good look. It's really telling when you hear an old Brooklyn guy say that the mob made things safe around here back in the day, yeah, because your family was from the same part of Italy as the folks running the mob. For every family that praises mob-controlled neighborhoods, there is another that was ruthlessly extorted for protection money every week of their lives. Perspective varies depending on what side of the fence you're on. Not taking a day off, or not utilizing your sick hours. People genuinely enjoy the grind and perceive being tired and sore as a badge of honor. Edit, whoa, didn't expect this comment to get that popular, but thanks for the upvotes and rewards. But, yeah, I said what I said. I hate seeing people being exploited at a workplace that doesn't value them, and screw over those who are genuinely good workers. To all you rise and grinders, keep doing you and I'll keep doing me. And yes, people naturally need rest. Any rom-coms where the lead characters aren't horrible people in toxic relationships? And I don't mean a good couple in a different genre. Specifically build as a rom-com with two people just doing their best despite hard lives, and not two people just being terrible human beings and then falling in love. My dad was an alcoholic and narcotics addict, nearly eight years clean this year after over 30 years of abuse. Most of my friends are bartenders or other restaurant workers and almost every one of them has had a reckoning with their alcohol consumption in the last year. One of my best friends went through severe withdrawal that was absolutely terrifying to watch, she is seven months clean now and is absolutely thriving, another nearly lost his job and his marriage. I gave my boyfriend an ultimatum last Christmas after the second time he threw up in his sleep, we're both very lucky I'm a light sleeper. I consider myself incredibly lucky that everyone has taken a harsh look at themselves and changed their behavior before they killed themselves with it. So many haven't been so lucky. It's not cute to blackout. It's not cute to almost choke on your own vomit. It's not cute to piss yourself. It's not cute to act like an ass to your loved ones. A girl falling in love with the bad boy or rebel guy and thinking that they can change them. There are too many shows and movies that portray this and think that this is a healthy relationship but in reality it's not. It's a toxic and abuse relationship that many women fall victim to. Your spouse died almost two months ago. You should get back into the dating scene. Allow me to pressure you into this unfamiliar situation where you'll be semi-isolated and exposed to a wide variety of strangers, many of whom have severe psychological disorders. There's no way that can end badly. Best friend slash parent slash boss in a surprising number of movies. A common symptom of ADHD is actually fatigue, that's something a lot of people really struggle to understand for some reason. And the memory issues, fuck me those are the worst. I actually used to be afraid I was getting early onset Alzheimer's before I found out memory issues was also an ADHD symptom because of the way it affects working memory. The worst I've seen is fathering autism. This man documents every single aspect of his nonverbal 16-year-old daughter's life, but each time that she tries to communicate to him that she doesn't want the camera in her face, he ignores her. It's so sad because she has no way to reach out for help and she never gets a break from the spotlight. 
her family makes boatloads of money off videos of her and use it to benefit themselves only. The mother has also used the platform that was created to advertise her MLM. A few months ago I sent a very rude reply to a message a guy sent me. I thought about apologizing and explaining I'm going through some things with my health and mental health. But I realized it's the first time in over two or three years he hasn't tried to contact me. I've told this guy I'm not interested and he kept pushing saying he just wants me in his life because he likes me so much, then proceeds to tell me all the ways I should change and be nicer to him every time he sees me. I wish I had someone who explained this to me when I was younger. Always bitched and moaned about how I was the friend zone guy. It took some growing up in my 20s to realize it was well deserved, and I was the asshole. Before that happened, I decided since only assholes get the girls, I'd be an asshole too. Didn't care who I hurt. Broke a few hearts for no good reason. Finally had that epiphany, and I've felt guilty about it ever since. I got made fun of in school because yes, I was a creep. Got put in the friend zone because, yes, I was a creep. All that emotional trauma I put on other people, that was my fault. I learned to accept fault. It became a principle of mine. This belief that I must accept fault for the situations I find myself absolutely. I've also accepted that, even if something isn't my fault, I can still accept responsibility. If you don't accept responsibility for anything, you can't do anything to change it. It's an extremely long and loopy rabbit hole, but the about face of having to understand my actions dictate how I'm treated and the situations I find myself in, it really changed me as a person. Not just in the personal relationship sense, but for everything. Women shaming other women is the real issue in offices. One of my co-workers at an old place took her entire three months of maternity time and another older woman was bitching about her being gone saying when I had my third kid I was back at work five days later. And I was just sitting there thinking you realize that isn't a flex right? You're a new mom and you chose a shitty office job over your newborn child. I used to work with girl who would make fun of a colleague's boyfriend, called him ugly and all sorts of horrible things then turned around and said she fancied a famous guy called Richard Ramirez, I was shocked. I turned to her and asked how she could make fun of anyone's relationship choices when she fancies a serial murderer and rapist, she started crying and saying I shouldn't have said that in front of everyone, but she made fun of others in front of everyone and it literally fell out my mouth in shock. I watched something about a guy who was super into mountain climbing and it was all about his trip to climb this one super hard mountain, not Everest, I think it started with an M, I don't know. But he had multiple mountain climbing friends who had died on less dangerous treks in the past, and I think a friend die or get into a serious accident in the one he wanted to climb, and he was now a father. They kept emphasizing how dangerous it was going to be, but the whole time, I couldn't stop thinking about his kids. I feel like if you make the commitment to have kids, you shouldn't go out doing unnecessary risky things just for the hell of it. At least not until they're adults and don't have to rely on you anymore. Like, which do you like more, mountain climbing or seeing your kids grow up? My father-in-law told me any time I have some downtime I should be working on a side hustle. Don't get me wrong, having more only would be great but my job is hard. It drains everything out of me. So I'm not going to spend my days off working just so I can go and work some more. Especially when I was working six days a week at my main job. Ugh. Whenever I hear the Joker I get reminded of this dude I knew in college who loved to act like the underdog and that it was him against the world. When really, he was just rude to guys and a creep to women, and would constantly use I'm the Joker, as his reasoning for being an ass. Not to vent but one time he was walking a female friend home who I happened to send a meme to, he instantly messaged me asking what tf I said to her. She was, literally in a relationship and did not like him. Here in my town, everyone is me exposes slash expose is toxico saying that their spouse is toxic but they love them. Or I'm married to a toxic person. 
I see stickers on windshields and give me a not very good feeling, I guess cause I was in a toxic relationship and it doesn't feel good for someone to go and brag about it like it a good fun way. Did I answer the question right? So much this. Anorexia has the highest fatality rate of any mental illness, and there's not glamorous about it. It's not even glamorous after recovery, if you manage to make it there there are all sorts of health complications that last well past active disease state and into the rest of your life. Currently dealing with infertility problems slash difficulty conceiving and carrying to term. Lost two babies already because 13 year old me absolutely fucked up my body, despite recovery for 8 years. You'd have to pay me a million dollars to go back. Lots of high schools have a toxic environment and mine was one of them. I was so stressed I developed GI issues that are still unresolved. Being an adult with independence, the ability to choose my work and the people around me has improved my life enormously. I have no idea where the best years of your life comes from. Guess people have different experiences than me. I was on the best way to become a pushover at work recently. I was working seven days of the week, and still lost my overtime hours that I collected for weeks without a single day off, because my colleague gave me some of the shittiest shifts I could get. I would come into work for four fucking hours. So when I refused to tell said colleague how much overtime I got, he threatened to call HR and ask them. In return I said fine but if you ever call me on my day off again, I won't pick up in response to how I worked the Sunday I had the day off because someone got sick, after I suggested I work on that day anyway but got refused, it's so f Mental illnesses and to an extent, neurodevelopmental impairment asterisk. Yes, both of these things should be more accepted, and people shouldn't be made to feel bad about what they cannot control but continually portraying them in a positive light and ignoring all the impairment that can be associated with them is detrimental to the understanding of the disease slash disorder. It's important to understand where the deficits and dysfunctions are so you can learn to deal with them and framing mental ill health and slash or neurodevelopmental disorders as quirky or deep makes addressing areas of concern difficult not only to do, but to communicate you are doing to others because they are adhering sometimes to a just accept yourself, narrative that although part of the solution is far from the entire solution, the romanticism of mental ill health also doesn't extend to those with severe disorder, s, leading to further excelcusion of that group because their issues don't fall in line with the stereotypical, inaccurate, portrayal seen in media and often online posted by people who don't really know what they are talking about. Asterisk I have both. I don't know if this has been said, but those news articles about how sick people couldn't afford their treatments but their community came together and helped them pay for it. Or people losing their homes slash cars slash teachers needing supplies slash etc. to avoid talking about how severe of an issue poverty and infrastructure is. Did aka dissociative identity disorder. Between kids on TikTok, movies, TV shows make it out to be so cringy and cool. It's a disorder that arises from severe trauma, you dissociate into different self-states because that's how your mind adapted to the severe trauma you faced, you dissociated to take on the trauma. It's not something that should be romanticized or displayed as cute. Dissociating into a different self-state can be scary and very vulnerable. As a survivor living with DID and CPTSD, I want awareness brought to DID in a respectful and dignifying way. Some psychiatric professionals don't even believe in it and people who have DID do not get the proper trauma-informed help. Not only DID but mental health conditions in general. Depression slash bipolar slash schizophrenia are not an edgy or cool trend. True individuals who have these conditions and spread awareness properly are awesome individuals, but people who spread misinformation or fake conditions are not cool. On TikTok they call psych hospitals grippy sock vacations being inpatient for mental health is not a vacation, it's anything but. I've been inpatient and have obtained trauma from the way I was treated. So yeah, stop romanticizing mental struggles because they are not fun and cute to live with. 100% I find myself struggling to believe anyone who tells me they have did now. Which is frustrating 
because I absolutely do not want to be that person who invalidates your trauma or mental illness, especially considering I am DX general anxiety disorder, but man. There are probably thousands of teenagers and young adults on TikTok talking about their alters and systems and my husband's best friend has did and it's terrifying. He never knows who he's picking up the phone to when she calls and it's a really scary situation. This poor woman experienced severe childhood trauma. It's not cute or fun. Hello, schizophrenic here with, a lot of comorbidities. I cannot believe the amount of people who confuse did and schizophrenia all because of that fucking movie split. Though I have to ask to someone with did, if you have seen DC's Doom Patrol, how do you like Crazy Jane? She has did as well and I hear positive feedback on her characterization from people diagnosed with did. I can't say I've witnessed schizophrenia romanticized. I've seen it vilified multiple times. Even peer-reviewed articles like to stress schizophrenics can only be autonomous with a ridiculous amount of help lest we become unstable and dependent. I was denied elective procedures and decision-making several times since my psych stuff is on my official clinic EMRs. The clinicians I had with saw my diagnosis and would repeatedly question me to make sure I can make my own decisions. I am an adult, to be clear. I was repeatedly admitted to a psych unit where I could tell the nurses got off on the power trip of the patients being helpless and was routinely accused of being crazy and childish and shoved fun antipsychotic cocktails, even pink slipped since allegedly, regardless that I was fully functioning, my schizophrenia made it necessary for me to be there. This is exactly why I hate being honest about my symptoms to anyone else outside of my therapist. I'm not suffering from all this, make no mistake, but I am severely struggling to the point where ECT is on the table because I cannot live like this and nothing I do changes anything. It doesn't help the media likes to paint my diagnosis as villain slash anti-hero origin story material. I wish it was that easy. Oh how I wish it was so easy for me to use all my trauma to become some crime fighting badass. Oh how I wish it was so easy for my schizophrenia to actually be some cool medium thing where I see and hear the deceased. Oh how I wish instead of lying in my bed, wanting to feel something for once just frickin' something I could don a cowl and a cape and tell people you have failed this city. I could go on and on. People talk about hyperfixation but they don't understand how it can be detrimental. They talk about oh I'm so OCD because I'm organized and they don't realize how obsessions and compulsions hinder you and damage your body. Oh I could get into it with misconceptions about autism too and how media romanticizes it. Schizophrenia doesn't make you a villain who needs to be humanized nor some sort of ghost hunting vigilante. ADHD doesn't make you hyper and quirky and not like other girls. OCD doesn't make you organized with all your fucking highlighters in the correct rainbow order or that you do routine housework daily. Did doesn't make you some crazy liar where you need to integrate or prove you have it to people. BP doesn't make you simply emotional. Depression doesn't make you lazy and you need some love interest to fix you. It all literally depends on your relationship with your diagnosis and your expression of your diagnosis for the positives and negatives you receive with your disability or disorder. Be it from trauma, a nexus event, or a neurological disability that brain scans can see these are not cute personality traits you tack onto people. The day to the media in all its forms stops romanticizing neurodivergency and trauma and takes out romance can fix you or the power of friendship will cure you is the day I will adopt a dog. Which I won't. Not because I don't like dogs I do but I comfortably recognize I cannot take care of a dog and all its needs with all my disabilities. I'm agreeing with all you're saying. Criminal lifestyles. Street gangs, cartels and the mob in particular. These are violent groups that terrorize both innocent people and their own members. The cartels are responsible for so much horrible shit that you could make up a story about them torturing a child to death for crying as they watch some sicarios rape its mother and many Latinos would nod and believe you because that's just the kinda utterly fucked up shit they do all the fucking time. Street gangs have children act as dealers and mutilate slash beat slash kill them for not making enough money and traffic countless women into prostitution, getting them hooked on heroin so they're rendered helpless. 
The mob terrorize innocent people and extort their own communities and anyone else they can get their claws into to bleed them dry of every dime they have as well as killing anyone who so much as looks at them the wrong way. These are bad people, very bad people who don't deserve an ounce of respect let alone admiration. People fighting or being a fighter with cancer or other terminal illnesses. People don't die of diseases or choose hospice because they are quitters. People who choose to die with a focus on comfort and quality of life should be labeled fighters too they are just fighting for something else. I've had to deal with this. A co-worker I was friends with insists on touching me, I don't generally like people touching me anyways but will put up with people touching my arms, this guy insists on rubbing my arms up and down and sometimes rubbing my side, like from my waist to below my armpit. I kept telling him not to touch me and he just ignored me to the point that last week I just screamed and swore at him to never touch me again. I'm barely civil to this guy now and he keeps asking me if we're good and I keep saying no. Being sick, going to the hospital, working in the hospital, being a doctor, being a nurse. It's not fun, it's fulfilling. It's stressful. We give up a lot of personal life for it. We make money. Yes, but there are hordes of administrators both inside and outside of the hospital whose literal job it is to decrease our pay by any means necessary. Now we have to deal with misinformation campaigns designed to profit off of people's healthy skepticism and unhealthy social media habits. FSCKU Facebook FSCKU Alternative Medicine Booksellers and Supplement Salesmen You harm people. Yes COVID-19 is real. SARS is real and it's a horrible way to die. People die alone, afraid, unable to breath, or sedated on a ventilator without so much as a final goodbye thought or dream for the world. And yet people have the nerve to blame us for the fragmented system they created. Well guess what, if nothing changes, you'll die an abrupt, or painful, or very, very expensive death too, and have no one to blame. I think the skinny thing is meant to play up the tragedy and shock like OMG look this girl thinks she's so fat when she's clearly not. If you want an actually good take on an eating disorder from the opposite gender I would actually recommend the episode The American Dad After School special from the show American Dad. It shows the grown adult father Stan realizing he has become overweight and then develops an addiction to exercise. He becomes delusional and paranoid and we are led to believe the family is actually trying to make him fatter until halfway through where we are taken out of his point of view and see what's really happening. His family were just trying to make him eat normally again and he's actually dangerously underweight and the trainer he's been seeing is actually a delusion. It's got jokes and stuff but it's actually really well done. They even make a joke about the gender imbalance when Stan goes to group therapy and the therapist keeps calling him lady or ma'am even when he tells him he's a guy. Tragic gay characters and the bury your gaze trope. Just because a person is gay doesn't mean they are automatically hot suicidal drug is that are doomed to suffer. I think it's good to remind others of the history of abuse toward gay people and the struggles involved but as a teen I just remember getting even more depressed because every gay movie I watched either ended in suicide or some other unhappy ending. Didn't help to see all the gay characters getting killed off on TV, becoming martyrs, or getting into romantic toxic relationships. I've been seeing a lot more healthy, upbeat romances and characters lately, but there's still a lot of shows that romanticize the emotional and tragic gay sufferer. Mental Illness it's not mysterious or charming or a source or troubled genius. It just sucks. I'm so fucking broken I don't know if I'll ever be okay, and every single day is a massive battle to even function like a normal person. Even my ex-wife acted like I was just lazy and full of excuses cause, she had depression but she still did stuff, and she was the person closest to me. Yet Hollywood will have you believe everyone with mental illness is secretly a troubled genius just looking for love or a child or whatever happy ending they are trying to sell, leaving out the lifelong struggle that probably followed the credits. Romanticizing the 1950s Things were shitty, people forget it's not like the 2010s, just with less technology and more muscle cars and milkshakes. Not everything was a sock hop where you're dreamy, 
fantasy greaser bad boy boyfriend would come and sweep you off your feet. It wasn't all sunshine in suburbia. You know why the women did all the cooking and the cleaning? Because the men were at work for insanely long hours, doing so much mind-numbing or back-breaking work to make money, to come back and support the wife and children he never gets to see but was socially obliged by society to have. The woman had few rights, and had to keep the house running and stocked and clean while caring for usually more often than not two children per household, while both had to keep up their social image. And if there was a draft? He'd be off to the military, while she stayed home now on her own to look after things, for when and if he returned. Neither party is having their needs 100% met. It wasn't an episode of your favorite black and white sitcom. But still there are people who will drool over the idea of a 1950s romance, or gross men online who push and chase that 50s trade wife material bullshit. And all the people who claim that manly men were left in that decade. High schoolers were treated like adults, dynamics were the way they were for a reason it wasn't good. This marks the end of the video. If you liked my contact, consider subscribing as it helps me a lot, see you until next time.